610 be considered as pending and brought up in red? Without objection. The clerk will report. Senator from Oklahoma, Mr. Coburn, proposes an amendment number 610 to amendment number 602. I ask that the unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, the bill we have before us today is a bill to fund emergency relief through FEMA for a lot of the emergency disasters that our country has experienced over the past six months. Uh, and I don't think there's a large disagreement that we ought to uh, take care of, of the areas that are the federal responsibility in the respective states for uh, uh, the extreme uh, weather tragedies as well as <clears throat> fire-related tragedies that, that have been experienced by multitude of states. Uh, the question, however, is given where we stand as a country, do we just borrow the money to do that and add it to the debt, or is the government running so efficient that we can't cut something else and make a choice about how we pay for it? And the bill is brought forward, uh, has no pay for at all. In other words, the assumption is if we pass this bill, we will go and borrow approximately $7 billion more uh, in the international markets and what I would put forward is that we know we have plenty of areas that we can cut now that are not effective, not efficient, that are wasteful, that are duplicative, and we would not have to borrow that additional money. Uh, the easiest thing in the world is to spend somebody else's money. And what we're doing with this bill by not paying for it is actually asking our grandchildren to pay for an obligation that we have today. And the amendment that I have considered, uh, have uh, asked to be called up, is nearly identical to a, an amendment that this body passed by a vote of 64 to 36 in April of this year. The Government Accountability Office brought forth a report on duplication that showed hundreds of millions of dollars in wasteful duplication. And this isn't the only area where we could go, but this is an area that we've already as a body agreed to is an effective way to pay and save money. And so we could easily find seven billion dollars by eliminating multiple programs <laughs> that accomplished the same thing. And so uh, let, me, let me just give some examples of what the GAO showed. The Department of Defense and the VA are both creating new medical record systems as we speak, both paying for independent contractors doing the same thing. They're all they're gonna have intertwined medical records ultimately and yet we don't need to set up two different programs. So by doing that, you could save a couple of billion dollars just by having one program for both VA and DOD. Uh, we have multiple contracts, according to the GAO, <clears throat> in terms of energy, interagency, and government area-wide contracts that, can, that actually increase our procurement costs where we could consolidate those and have one contract and actually save money. But we haven't done that. That's something that, that can be done by the, by the OMB at our direction. The other area which is e extremely interesting, and the President's already agreed to this, they're already starting to do it, but we could do it much faster and save a significant amount of money. We can save 150 to 200 billion dollars over the next 10 years just by consolidating data centers. We initially had uh, <clears throat> uh, some 500 of those, and I think we're up to around 2,000. Uh, <clears throat> we had 432 in 1998 and 2,000 data centers, federal data centers, in 2010. And what everybody knows is we could cut that by about half, not have any change in the effectiveness, and save about $150 billion over the next 10 years. 
So what, what this amendment does, <clears throat> it identifies the areas uh, listed in the GAO report and instructs the OMB to find those that are most likely to be achievable to come to $7 billion. We have agreed to do this in the past on a previous bill uh, when Senator Warner and I offered this amendment jointly to pay for the spending. Uh, <clears throat> I can go on with a lot of other areas in terms of wasteful spending. I won't. But I, I would make this one plea. In August, we left here after passing a debt limit increase, the largest debt limit increase we've ever in incurred in segments, and said we were going to start living within our means. We've created a super committee to find $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years in savings. And while they're doing that, if we decide to pass a, a emergency supplemental bill for FEMA and don't pay for it, we're going to be working exactly the opposite of direction of what we said we needed to do. <clears throat> and so the, the, the facts are is we're, we're almost schizophrenic. We say we need to cut spending, and yet we're going to spend $7 billion more, but we don't want to find some spending to cut to pay for it. We just want to borrow it. And you can understand why very few Americans have confidence in us, because on the one hand, we're addressing the problem. On the other hand, we're ignoring the problem. And so I, it would be, I think it would behoove our, the confidence level in, in this institution if, in fact, we tried to pay and found the courage and the willpower to say, if we're going to spend additional money, we're going to eliminate, we're going to create priorities. And we're actually going to eliminate spending somewhere else to be able to pay for this, to do this more important thing. Uh, I have trouble understanding, uh, even when I talk to our colleagues privately, why we wouldn't do this. Why we wouldn't pay for this $7 billion by reducing wasteful spending elsewhere. And so as, as, we, as we go to the vote <coughs> at 4 o'clock, <coughs> the, the question that people ask is, why was it okay to cut the spending from these departments back in April, but it's not okay to cut the spending now? And 64 of our colleagues voted to cut this spending in April. And so, you know, I, I, I know several are opposed to paying for this, but we're in a new day. We live in a new world. Uh, the Oklahoma Chamber of Commerce was up here uh, this, <clears throat> this week, and the title of, of, of their meeting was New Realities. Well, the new reality is, is we're going to run to the end of the time at which we can borrow money or afford to pay the interest rate on the money that we can borrow. And <clears throat> the discipline that we need is to live within our means. And this is one step that, number one, will be the right thing to do for future generations. It's the right thing to do to build confidence in our institution. And it's the right thing to do to eliminate waste and duplication in the federal government. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, yield back the floor and note the absence of a uh, quorum and uh, make a point that I will talk again on this prior to the vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
Mr. President. Senator from Kentucky. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask uh, consent to call up my amendment number 613. The clerk will report. The senator from Kentucky, Mr. Paul, proposes an amendment number 613 to amendment number 602. On page 12, between lines 11 and 12, insert the following. Uh, Title VI. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that we dispense with the reading. Without objection. Mr. President, this amendment is an amendment to pay for the emergency funds. I think for too long in this body, we have just simply added on funds, often for good causes, but we just simply keep spending money we don't have. I think the mark of a good legislator is making priorities, and if you choose to spend some money on an emergency, you take the money from somewhere else in the budget. We've proposed in this amendment to take the money from foreign aid. When you ask the American people, do you think we should be sending welfare to other countries or building bridges in other countries when our bridges are falling down in this country, 77% of the American people think we shouldn't be sending money overseas when we have problems here at home. So this amendment would take unspent foreign aid money from this year and apply it towards the uh, disaster funding. It would also take some unspent money from the State Department. But I think what it is is it's responsible budgeting. It's basically taking money from another area and spending it and not adding to our debt. There are repercussions to the debt we add. I tell people that the debt has a face. Every time you go to the store and your gas prices are rising or your food prices are rising, the reason your prices are rising is because we have to pay for the debt by printing new money. As we print new money at the Federal Reserve to pay for our debt, you diminish the value of your dollar and your gas prices rise and your food prices rise. Also, economists have said that up to a million jobs a year are being lost to finance our debt. So what I would ask is, as we pay for these natural disasters, we take the money from elsewhere in our budget. Mr. President, I also rise in support of Senator Coburn's plea not to, say, not to target the transportation funds. Right now, we're asking that highway funds, 10% of them, go to beautification projects, turtle tunnels, movie theaters. Well, Mr. President, in our state of Kentucky, we have a bridge that was closed down this week, the Sherman Minton Bridge. There are three bridges in Louisville. One of them's closed down. Traffic is stacked up for hours, and you're telling me that we need to have turtle tunnels. Okay? Something's seriously wrong with government when we're forcing state governments to spend 10% of their transportation money on turtle tunnels, white squirrel parks, and movie theaters. We have another bridge that's needed in the northern part of our state, Brent Spence Bridge, where debris from the bridge is falling. We had a bridge in Minneapolis four years ago that fell into the river and killed 13 people. We need to, as a nation, set our priorities, but I think it's incorrect and a real problem that we're telling people they have to take 10% of the transportation funds and put it into bike pass. Look, I'm a bicyclist and I like bike pass as much as anybody, but when bridges are falling into the river, when a major metropolitan area like Louisville, Kentucky, has one-third of their bridge capacity closed down because the bridge is dangerous to travel on, these are emergency problems. It also buys into what I'm talking about with the foreign aid. We cannot send welfare to other countries that we don't have. We're not sending them money that is from our savings. We're sending money that we're borrowing from China or that we're printing up. There are ramifications to this debt. We are borrowing money at $40,000 a second. There are ramifications to this borrowing. The debt has a face. It's not just an empty number. When they say that our national debt is $14 trillion or that we're adding $1.5 trillion to the debt every year, there are ramifications to that and there is a face. The face is unemployment. The face is people losing jobs. You see it in the grocery store with your prices rising. The debt has ramifications. In Europe, 
You're seeing the end stages of this in some countries. You're seeing chaos and rioting in the streets. We had rioting in London recently. We've had rioting in Greece, Portugal, Spain. All of these countries are tumbling under a burden of debt, and it's been predicted that this is coming to the United States. It is coming soon. It is a contagion of debt that is sweeping the world, and it's all pyramided upon the U.S. dollar. Once upon a time, banks in Europe held gold as their reserve. They now hold the dollar as reserve. When the dollar tumbles or when we have trouble paying for our debt, there will be massive worldwide problems. We are in the middle of the worst recession since the Great Depression, and there are no signs that any of the policies coming from the White House are working. In fact, the first stimulus package didn't work. Two, more, two million more people are out of work since the president came into office. The price of gasoline has doubled. Our debt has been downgraded. We are set to accumulate under this administration more debt than all 43 previous presidents combined. It is not working. So recently the president came over to a joint session of Congress and presented to us the son of stimulus the son of a stimulus that did not work in the first place. And he says, well, we're just going to tax those rich people. Well, rich people hire poor people. We most of us have jobs because rich people hired us. They're talking about adding $400 billion in new taxes on those who make $200,000 a year or more. You say, well, the rich ought to pay their fair share. The rich are paying for the income tax. 47% of Americans pay no income tax. So half of Americans are already paying for all of the income tax. The Bush tax cuts actually made the tax code more progressive because they dropped off more people from the lower end. If you look at those who make more than $200,000 a year, it's 3% of the public. They earn 30% of the income and they pay 50% of the income tax. So if you're saying that the tax code needs to be made more fair, it would probably be that you would have to make the tax code less progressive. But the bottom is if they thought or I thought it would help people, we could do it. It's going to hurt people. The head of the Congressional Budget Office is an objective spokesman who analyzes government. He testified before the Super Committee yesterday that it would be a mistake to raise taxes. The preponderance of economists say it would be a mistake to raise taxes in the middle of a recession. It will lead to more joblessness. Pitting one group, class envy, pitting one group against another gets us nowhere. Years ago we tried this. We said we'll have a special tax on those who own yachts. Well, guess who lost their jobs? The men and women making forty and fifty thousand dollars a year making the yachts lost their jobs. It doesn't work. It's unhealthy. It's not good for America to blame one class of people versus the other. We want to lift up everyone in America. We want a thriving and growing economy. When we lowered tax rates in the 80s, we had 6 and 7 percent growth in a year. We're at 1 percent growth, and we look like we're heading in the wrong direction. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. This new jobs plan by the pre president is the son of stimulus, the son of a stimulus that didn't work the first time, that when you calculated it, cost $400,000 per job. It didn't work. We shouldn't be doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I would say, in conclusion, that my amendment here is the responsible budgetary amendment and it pays for the new disaster funding. If you wish to help people and you think your federal government should be involved with disaster funding, it should be paid for. It should not be borrowed from China and it should not be simply printed up at the printing press. We should pay for it. So I urge support, I urge other senators to support my amendment which would offset the disaster funding by reducing a corresponding amount from foreign aid, the welfare we give to other nations, many of them rich nations. So I would ask serious consideration of that. I would also ask serious consideration of Senator Coburn's proposal that when we have bridges crumbling in our country, that we not force states to build turtle tunnels, squirrel sanctuaries, and movie theaters.
We have crumbling bridges, and we need to get this through, and we need to say we are not going to force the states to decide that they have to have these beautification projects. Thank you, Mr. President, and I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
resolve an impasse that we have, <clears throat> but we're not there yet. And I wanted to <clears throat> be clear with my colleagues what my intent was, and if we can work uh, the problems out, I'm, I'm happy to try to do that. <clears throat> but I have uh, three separate unanimous uh, consent requests uh, that I'm going to be asking for. Uh, one will <clears throat> uh, separate out the FAA bill, pass it, and send it to the House. Uh, another will separate out the transportation bill, eliminating the transportation enhancement component of it and send it to the House. And another one eliminates the transportation component of the combined bill and sends it back to the House. And I understand the leader's concern with those, but uh, felt I would exercise my right to offer those unanimous consents. So therefore, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.R. 2887, the House passed FAA Service Transportation Reauthorization Bill, and that my amendment at the desk related to a four-month FAA extension be agreed to. The bill as amended, be read a third time and passed, and the motions to reconsider be laid upon the table. With no intervening action or debate, any statements related to the record be printed in, uh, to the bill be printed in the record. I object. <clears throat> Objection is heard. Uh, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.R. 2887, the House passed FAA Surface Transportation Reauthorization Bill, that the Coburn Amendment at the desk related to repealing the 10 percent enhancement mandate be agreed to. The bill as amended be read a third time passed. The motions to be to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate, and any statements related to the bill be printed in the record. Object. That objection is heard. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.R. 2887, the House passed FAA Surface Transportation Bill uh, reauthorization that my amendment at the desk related to a six-month surface transportation extension that repeals the 10 percent transportation enhancement mandate be agreed to. The bill as amended be read a third time and passed. The motions to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate, and any statements related to the bill be printed in the record. Mr. President, I object. An objection is Mr. heard. Mr. President, before my friend leaves the floor, I would ask unanimous consent that at a time be determined by me, after consultation with, with Senator McConnell, the Senate proceed to the consideration of calendar number 167, H.R. 2887, Surface and Air Transportation Program Extensions, that the only first degree amendment in order, the only first degree amendments in order to the bill be the Colburn Amendment regarding transportation enhancements. The Paul Amendment regarding limitation to highway trust funds and the Paul Amendment regarding FAA funding levels. That there be up to two hours of debate on the amendments equally divided between the two leaders or the designees prior to a vote or votes in relation to the amendments in the order listed. That there be no amendments in order to any of the amendments prior to the votes. That the amendments be subject to a 60 vote threshold. That upon disposition of the amendments, the Senate proceed to vote on passage of the bill as amended if amended that there be no other amendments, points of order, or motions in order to the bill other than budget points of order, other than budget points of order, and the applicable motions to waive.
and the motion we consider be considered made and laid on the table. I object. An objection is heard. I would note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Well, Mr. President, on both uh, with the time till four o'clock, be equally divided between the majority and minority. Without objection. Mr. Akaka.
from call be dispensed with? Without objection. Mr. President, we are looking at a FEMA emergency supplemental, and there is no doubt that this country has sustained a series of disasters that will require federal support and funding. Uh, we've seen those in Alabama, my home state, where we had the worst series of tornadoes in history and some of the most powerful uh, that completely uh, demolished uh, two-story brick homes, nothing but foundations left, and lives were lost to an extraordinary degree and people were injured. We've had floods and we've got fires around the country and droughts. So we have some of that every year and some of this is uh, unusual and it's incumbent upon us in Congress to wrestle with that, to try to figure out what should be done, how can we best supplement the insurance and state actions and, and local people's abilities to respond and make the, share a bit of the pain throughout the country. Uh, I was, since I've been interested in the emergency bill, and had some ideas. I was surprised that it was appeared on the Burma sanctions bill, or we were told that it was going to be added to it, sort of out of the blue. And it was going to be $7 billion, $6.9 billion. And I just hadn't had a chance to know and account and see what those numbers were and whether or not they were justified. Uh, but Majority Leader Reid said, we want to move to that. That's what we want to do. Now, some said, and surely that is not true, that Senator Reid was setting a trap for the Republicans, that he would offer this bill and throw it out and, and he would have extra money in it and we would complain and then he would say the Republicans don't love people who suffer disaster like I love people who suffer with disaster. Uh, you don't care. You don't want to help people that are hurting. Uh, you are not good people. I'm a good person. I love them more than you do. Now, I hope that's not true. Maybe I don't believe it's true. Surely it's not true. But I will just point this out that President Obama's funding request for this supplemental that we've seen was for $500 million in, in 2011, uh, $4.6 uh, 4 billion for next year, totaling $5.1 billion. That's what the President proposed, but the Democratic Senate proposal that Senator Reid has uh, moved forward here has $804 million in 2011, 6.1 billion in 2012 for 6.9 billion. Well, that's about almost two billion dollars difference. Well, you know, they say that's not much money. Just two billion dollars. We spend a lot more money than that around here on all kinds of things, and uh, we shouldn't worry about it, Sessions. You're just slowing down the emergency bill. It's got to go through right now. Well, I just pointed out previously that uh, two billion dollars is a lot of money. We have an education budget in my state that's pretty sizable, but the basic general fund budget of Alabama is about two billion dollars. We're an average size state. We're about one fiftieth, four million people of the United States. So it's two billion dollars is two billion dollars. A billion here and a billion there, and you're talking about real money. So I'm just raising a question. I suggest that this kind of rapid spending, emotional, political movement of money through this body is why this country has gotten into financial trouble. We just increase the price tag for a bill, $2 billion, and rush it through and attack anybody who has the gumption to stand up like Senator Tom Coburn and raise some real questions about it. How much of this can we pay for?
Can we pay for it all? We probably could and probably should. Or pay for part of it so it's not borrowed. You see, emergency in general is debt. When you declare something an emergency, you're adding to the debt. Uh, it means that it's not under the budget. You have a budget limit, and you try to all the spending supposed to be under your budgetary limit, although we haven't had a budget here in two years. But when you do a supplemental, it doesn't count that way. I see the presiding officer, um, you know, pretty sophisticated in these things. I remember I was talking to a senior congressman about an emergency bill years ago, and he said, well, well, about a bill. It really wasn't an emergency. And he said, well, Jeff, we need to put it on the emergency supplemental. I said, why? He says it doesn't count against the deficit. And I said, why? He said, I don't know. It just doesn't count. What he meant was, I now know, that it, it, it's not part of the budgetary numbers. It's on top of it. It adds to the debt in general. So we've got to be careful about that. And we are borrowing now 40 cents of every dollar we spend. That's not a misprint. I'm not speaking erroneously. 40 cents of every dollar that's spent this year is borrowed. So I say responsible senatorial management requires us to examine the legislation. And when we have a bill that's about 40% uh, more than the president asked for, maybe that ought to throw up a red flag around here. Maybe we ought to examine it more closely because every single penny that's spent should be spent wisely. And there are two areas. Are you spending money that are not needed at all? And we've had some of that under emergency spending. Or are you spending uh, money that could be spent better on other problems that arose from the emergency than the money you're spending it on? And I've been to hurricane damages. I've been to flood damages. I've been to tornado damages. Uh, of s drought damages. It's hard to get the money to the people who really need it and who you can justify. This is not just throwing money at something. So we can do a better job of that, and Congress really needs to be more uh, involved. So um, I just think that uh, $2 billion is a lot, uh, and we ought to be careful before we do that. Most of the money is not going to get spent until next year by far. Overwhelmingly, 80% uh, of it is to be spent next year. And so we ought to be taking time to do this right. And uh, at today's hearing in the Budget Committee, I emphasize the economic danger our country is facing as a result of the increasing deficit. We had uh, three economists testifying. Two of them were selected by our Democratic majority colleagues. And we asked whether they agreed that it would be wise to pursue policies that create jobs rather than more without creating debt. In other words, can we? They all acknowledge that increasing debt is a dangerous thing. And so we discussed whether or not we should seek ways to create jobs and growth in America without adding to the debt. Wouldn't that be smart? They all agreed that it would. Uh, things such as producing more American in energy, reducing costly bureaucratic regulations, and instituting growth-oriented tax reform. All three witnesses said those are good things to do for America. And I would say if you're going to spend $7 billion or $5 billion, uh, on an emergency, it helps Americans' growth, productivity, competitiveness. If that money is spent the best possible way, every penny of it, to help people really in need and to help increase our national productivity. So those are some of the concerns I have, Mr. President. I just wanted to share those thoughts because I think we would have been better off had this bill come through the regular process. We had full testimony from the administration, witnesses from FEMA who will be handling the money, saying forth in detail where they expect to spend
them the money, how it's needed, and how they're going to do it in a way that's fair and, and helps the people in the right way. I don't believe that the way this bill is moving is careful enough, uh, and I believe it places at risk the Treasury of the United States. I thank the President and will yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.